The Terrorist Next Door, a book written by Eric Stackelbeck, and he is with us today to finish and continue our conversation with regards to his interview of a terrorist and more about the threat of terrorism, not only here in America, but around the world. Eric, welcome back to Faith and Freedom. Matt, great to be here. Thank you. Eric, we were talking yesterday. uh, We were laying the groundwork about Islam. We talked about the idea whether Islam is a religion of peace, and you ultimately indicated fundamentally that it's not through history, uh, that it's not. And in fact, that as you get later in the life of Muhammad, it becomes more violent towards Christians and Jews. And that takes precedent over anything that went before. But we also talked about the fact that you were interviewing a terrorist in the Great Britain, and you were talking about the mindset, and that's how we got into this. So as we circle back, I want to come back to that time when you were interviewing this individual and what was motivating him to do what he does? Well, Matt, the whole world, in the eyes of jihadists, Islamists, from al-Qaeda to the Muslim Brotherhood to Hezbollah, whether they're Sunni or Shia, the whole world must be subservient to Islam. Uh, Islam means submission. And it's interesting because he made that point. Islam means submission. The terrorist that you were interviewing, yes. and his name is? Saad al faqa and you were interviewing him in London. He's there getting government benefits, yes. lives in a nice home, mm-hmm. but he's also a terrorist. Yes, he is. He's, he's a wanted terrorist, wanted in the U.S. Several other individuals in London, many are wanted in the U.S. Uh, they're considered global terrorists. So he's wanted in the U.S., but he's living there in London yeah. getting government benefits. The police let him know that there was a an attempt to take his life. Yes. Uh, Why does he not get extradited to the United States? Well, here's the deal, Matt. Uh, Liberal British judges, and they're scattered throughout Great Britain, they refuse to extradite people like Saad al-Faqa back to their home countries. He's from Saudi Arabia, like Saudi Arabia, like like Egypt, because they say these individuals will be tortured. If we send them back to the Middle East, they'll be tortured by their home governments. So much better to leave them here in Great Britain where they can plot – Against British society. But what about the United States? Does the United States have uh, an arrest warrant out for him? Yeah. You know, he's a guy – and there's a few guys in Great Britain, Matt, who we would like the Brits to extradite, but they've been dragging their feet. Now, there's one guy in particular that they did extradite, thankfully. His name was Abu Hamza al-Masri, otherwise known as The Hook. True story. This guy was missing his hands. He lost them on the battlefield in Afghanistan, so he had two prosthetic hooks Hmm. as his hand. Better to point at the infidels when he gave his Friday sermons. But he was extradited to the U.S. from from Great Britain. But this one, they're not extraditing him, and he's there getting protection. Now, while you're talking to him, um, it's fascinating that you were there with a real terrorist, and you're exploring why he does what he does. What was he saying? What was some of the high points of your conversation with him? Well, first of all, I have to say there's there's few times in your life where when you're in the room with the presence of evil, where you can viscerally feel evil and you're staring it in the face. And this was one of those one of those moments. Uh, I think the high points or should I say the low points of my conversation with him, the overriding thing, the overriding theme was this. The world must submit to Islam, and this is how we do it. We reestablish an Islamic caliphate. Now, what that is is a – if you can picture this – a global Islamic superstate. Picture the entire Muslim world, every Muslim nation united economically, militarily, politically into one all-powerful force dedicated to taking on Israel and the West. That is the goal. Now, the last caliphate – was disbanded in 1923. And ever since, people like Saad al-Faqa have pined, have mourned for its reestablishment. They want a worldwide Islamic caliphate, which is governed by Islamic Sharia law. Let's go back to 1923. What was the caliphate that was disbanded at that time? The last caliphate was uh, ruled by the Turks, by the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Now, with World War I, it was disbanded. Ataturk came to power in Turkey. Turkey went secular, which has been swiftly reversed over the past few Mm -hmm. years. But in 23, the caliphate was disbanded once and for all, we thought. And Matt, I have to say real quick, sitting here last year, okay, today's December 1st, 2011. 
At this time last year, if you would have said the word caliphate to me and said there's a possibility that the caliphate will be reestablished, I would have said, no way, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing events lining up right now in the Middle East and North Africa rapidly where I believe we could see that Islamic caliphate reestablished in our lifetime. So you're essentially mm -hmm. saying that you could see a return of what was the old Ottoman Empire. Sure. This Ar so-called Arab Spring is an Islamist winter. Let's not be fooled by the mainstream media narrative, uh, by the Obama administration narrative. This is turning into a very, very nasty thing, and it's happening rapidly. You know, what you just said was echoed by an individual who is uh, in Israel. He's been a, an advisor to Benjamin Netanyahu and other uh, prime ministers there. He spoke to our Liberty Ambassador Council program in September of uh, 2011, and he said the exact same thing. What you're seeing there, the Arab uh, Spring, is an Islamic winter. And he used the whole seasonal thing yeah. to talk about that illustration. And here in the West, uh, we seem to be not uh, recognizing that serious threat that's happening. Matt, here's an interesting point for you. As Hosni Mubarak was falling in February 2011, and we're being thrown under the bus by this administration, I'm sad to say, not that he was a good man. He's a vicious guy. But in Egypt, it's about as good as you're going to get, unfortunately. As he was falling, I was sitting in Jerusalem. I was in Israel and in meetings with some very high-level Israeli government officials. And this was as Mubarak was falling, when everyone was still uh, uh, so excited about the Arab Spring, the potential for democracy, the young Facebookers and Twitters in Egypt who were swiftly brushed aside by the Islamists. But high-level Israeli government officials were saying, look, this is not going to end well. This is either going to end up like Turkey, where there's a slow period of Islamization, like under Erdogan in Turkey, or it's going to end up like Iran, where it's a full-fledged Islamic revolution. So from the outset, Israeli government leaders were cognizant of what was going to happen here. Well, you see the same thing happening there in Egypt as well. And uh, who knows where that's going to go with the Muslim Brotherhood starting Absolutely. in Egypt. And that's where their ultimate uh, origin is. And now they may become the dominant party there. Uh, and we can talk about that later in the program. The going back to this particular interview. Um, were you um, were you intimidated by that? Were you afraid uh, during that time that you could not ask him questions, um, or were you freely asking him whatever question you wanted? Was he freely responding? You know, you have to be cagey, Matt. When you're in the room with these guys, you want to get access. You want them to sit down with you. And interesting point here. He knew I was a Christian journalist, and he said, "Look, because you're a Christian jur journalist, I won't go on camera with you." I'll give you an off-camera interview. So I scribbled furiously in the notepad for two hours. Um, I didn't feel scared. Of course, you get butterflies a little bit. You feel a little nervous. But in every situation I go into that's hairy, if it's a mosque or what have you, I pray Psalm 91. God will give his angels charge over you. And that gives me the confidence. I feel like I'm doing what God wants me to do. And the Lord will give me discernment if it's a nasty situation to get out of there. So in the same way that your Christian values compel you to do things that are good, um, compel you to live a moral life, are you saying that his Islamic values are compelling him and he is guided by those values to do exactly the opposite, to kill or to maim or to force uh, through a penalty of taxation uh, those who do not accept um, Islam. Yes. It's a double-edged sword because the five pillars of Islam are pretty benign. Uh, the pillars of Islam, for instance, uh, the Shahada, give allegiance to Muhammad and Allah, uh, make pilgrimages to Mecca, give uh, charity, alms. Those are some of the pillars of Islam. But on the other hand, you have the call to j violent jihad, the call to establish Sharia, subjugate Christians, Jews. So... At the end of the day, nasty stuff. I want to talk to you tomorrow and through the rest of the week about how that threat is uh, being seen and developed, maybe even below the radar in the United States of America. And uh, because the title of your book is The Terrorist Next Door, and that doesn't mean just the terrorist over in the Middle East. No. It's the terrorist next door. You're talking also about the United States of America as well. In the heartland, the Bible Belt, people will be shocked. Eric Stackelbeck is our guest, and his book, brand new, is The Terrorist Next Door, How the Government is Deceiving You About the Islamic uh, Threat. You'll want to get that book. You can go to Liberty Council's website, lc.org, or you can call us at 1-800-671-1776. That's 800-671-1776. Or go to the website, lc.org. When you go there, you can also sign up for the Liberty Alert. 
and for the Liberator newsletter as well. Remember Liberty Council with your financial gifts and prayers. You can do that right there on the website at lc.org. Our guest tomorrow and the rest of this week will be Eric Steckelbeck, so you want to tune in next time.